Good afternoon, colleagues, uh, friends, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this funding strategy group session on university shared services, drivers, benefits, success factors and challenges. Shared services are increasingly being used to enable functional transformation, develop expertise and optimize the use of scarce resources or skills across multiple sectors. All universities run a number of business functions which are critical for the operational efficiency. These activities are generally identical across all the universities. Many of them, some would argue, do not accrue any distinctiveness or special advantage to individual universities. These activities are expensive and can draw resources away from the core academic focus of universities. Studies suggest that a wide range of services could potentially be shared within and across higher education institutions, offering several potential benefits. Now we have four accomplished speakers to help us discuss this important topic. And without much ado, I would like to invite Professor Osman to make a presentation. But before I invite Professor Osman, just to introduce myself, my name is Gerald Omer. Um, I'm a member of the Funding Strategy Group. I'm standing in for Professor Tawana Kupe, who is the chairperson of the Funding Strategy Group and the vice chancellor of the University of Pretoria. Now, Professor Roxana Osman is a professor of education and the deputy vice chancellor academic at the University of the Witwatersrand. Rand. She's the former Dean of the Faculty of Humanities also at the University of the Witwatersrand. Rand. She holds the UNESCO Chair in Teacher Education for Diversity and Development. Over to you, Professor Osman. Um, thanks so much, Professor Omar. And also thank you to Yusuf for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, I did wonder about shared services and what actually what was meant by it. So thank you for your introduction. It helped quite a lot to be able to focus the idea. I've really, inter I've really interpreted uh, shared services as questions about financial sustainability. And um, um, my comments, my introductory comments and my conclusion should really be interpreted in that context. I also understand that the input from today's panel is really to, um, to take forward the aims of the various uh, USEF strategy groups. And in the case of this panel, the finance strategy group. So my input is intended really in the spirit of advancing the work of the finance strategy group. I've been thinking about um, uh, shared services very much in the context of what it means for universities and how it focuses or should focus our attention to financial sustainability. My sense is that there are four areas that we have to focus on if we are to think about universities as sustainable spaces into the future. Now, I think all of us will acknowledge that sustainability is not just um, financial imperative, but should include environmental imperatives and the socio-emotional sustainability of our university communities. That is communities within the university, but also communities in which our universities are embedded. So I'd like to argue that actually um, shared services is not just about within institutions, but actually expands to outside of the university and into the communities in which we are embedded. Now, this does not mean that we should tackle the drivers or the questions of drivers associated with sustainability um, 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 in a particular way or in a single-minded way. I think I'm mindful and I see it from my own interpretation of how I've interpreted this topic. I think that there are different meanings associated with sustainability and with shared services as a strategy or a driver for sustainability within the university. I also think that uh, shared services in an unequal university and country context um, demands different ways of thinking about institutional priorities and financial sustainability. And through my input this afternoon, I would like to contribute to this different way of thinking by proposing or at least arguing that there are four areas that ought to shape our thinking as we think about financial sustainability and shared services as a driver for such. The first point I'd really like to make is, I think we need to have a long-term framework for funding to engender certainty. I think uncertainty is harmful to sustained provision of quality teaching, quality education, and quality research. 
uncertainty and a stop-start approach also has detrimental effects on our country development. So a long-term framework is absolutely vital for our sector. And that for me is the first point that needs to shape our thinking as we begin to think about sustainability and shared services. I also have a sense actually from my experience in higher education that there's a false economy around questions of sustainability and shared services. That sometimes shared services are proposed as sustainable opportunities. But what in fact happens is underfunding is the result of this kind of idea that shapes sustainability. And underfunding and cuts actually undermine competitiveness of the South African higher education. I think it induces brain drain of staff and of top students. And with student mobility, many students not returning to their home country, compromising us as a country and compromising us long down into the future. So sometimes unsustainable ways are proposed as sustainable opportunities, but this becomes a false economy, which results not just on, on the financial sustainability, but also on the human resource sustainability in terms of the brain drain. I want to point out that in some ways, cuts and underfunding have an intergenerational effect they don't just affect the university of today, but they detrimentally affect the university of tomorrow, making recovery almost impossible. So the second point around um, shared services and sustainability is really that we need to be clear when we propose sustainability strategies, are these in fact undercutting, underfunding, and undermining of competitiveness of the South African higher education. I do think that if we're thinking about shared services and we're thinking about sustainability, then private sector and philanthropists should be playing a big part in sustainability and in shared services. I do think that collaboration helps transcend resource constraints by pooling of resources and expertise. However, I do think that there's a recalibration required. And what does this recalibration um, involve? I mean, we have to take into account that actually high net individuals have lost a third of their net worth in the last 18 months. So we have to rethink how we want philanthropy to be involved with us in our sustainability mission. They've lost a third of their net worth the nature of work has changed overnight. And that actually we are, we are seeking resources and funding essentially for a very uncertain future. So I think there's a opportunity to change tactic if we want this collaboration with the private sector and the philanthropist. The leak, I think the recalibration must show that we aren't just universities who ask but we are also a sector who gives. The change in tactic must show that through philanthropy, we can demonstrate regional, continental and global solidarity at its best. So by all means, let, philanthropy, let philanthropists and the private sector be involved in shared services and our sustainability, but let's do it in a way that demonstrates solidarity. Another part of this recalibration does mean that as institutional leaders, we should not just see financial sustainability as separate from the intellectual work that our colleagues do. I would argue that actually as institutional leaders, we need to have a profound understanding of the intellectual work of the university, and in fact, a deep respect for different disciplinary traditions within our university. After all, faculties remain the lifeblood of universities. And we need to showcase this work to attract funding that we need. Now, sometimes we look at the intellectual project as requiring funding from us. 
And that's quite true. In fact, most of our universities, the big part of our budgets are spent in supporting the, internet and the intellectual project. But here I'm making a separate point. The point I'm making here is that financial sustainability is closely tied to the intellectual work of the university. The, this intellectual work is not just work that requires resources from us, but in fact, it is also something that can attract resources into the university if university leaders see a close link between financial sustainability and the intellectual work that we do. We can use this intellectual work, showcase this intellectual work to attract resources into the university. I think the fourth element that I would like us to think about in shaping our conversations about financial sustainability and shared services is really to ensure that university systems use resources optimally. And I think this is about the efficient use of resources, which is gonna be vital to sustainability. To my mind, this is, one, this is one of the most low hanging fruits that we can use to prosper and to sustain ourselves financially. And this is optimal use of resources. And this is where shared services play a significant role. I think what shared services do is they allow for a seamless experience for staff and students. And as I said earlier, it means different things to different people. But let me give an example here to illustrate. And I have no doubt that my colleagues on the panel will be able to put facts and figures to questions about shared service services. Here I think of particularly of the work of um, Dr. Parker, who's done significant work in the sector around financial sustainability and so on. So I think you'll be able to get specific examples there. But let me give you an example of how I think shared service can be a low hanging fruit in a university or across universities. And I'll give you the example of thinking about the provisioning of social justice in the university as a shared service. Now, most universities have transformation office and uh, employee relations office, a disability rights office, an office that deals with discrimination and so on. And I think one could really think about this cluster, this social justice cluster, as a way in which you can share services. The net effect of shared services in this kind of a cluster does mean that students and staff members who are on the receiving end of discrimination or injustice actually have a one-stop place to get support and to get a service. The knock-on effect for universities is significant in terms of financial resources, but the effect for staff and students is far bigger and far more valuable than the resources that we save in sharing a service like this. That's just one example. There are several examples. If one thinks about research institutes within universities, research programs within universities, we speak much about interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. Yet, if you look at our work, we work in, in silos. And shared services, just looking at the financial aspects of shared service, sharing administrative support, sharing human resource support, sharing financial administration support, all contribute to efficiencies in ways that we've never thought about or in ways that we've never been able to implement. So for me, the, universe, the issue around shared service is really the question about using, using resources optimally. And my sense is this is one of the areas we can do significant work if we want to think about financial sustainability. So let me conclude by saying that our futures as a sector are tied and interrelated in a way that goes beyond our control. The four ideas that I've put on the table that can help us shape conversations around shared services, I think could make a contribution to how we think about shared services and financial sustainability. But I'd like to make a concluding point, and that is financial sustainability is often characterized by reactiveness. 
a reaction to each other, a reaction to an event or event or events in our sector, and reaction to structures or a reaction to circumstances. And in the face of global uncertainty, I want to suggest that financial sustainability also needs to be characterized by anticipation, not just by reaction, but also by anticipation. Allow me a moment just to explore, explain what I mean by anticipation. By this, I do not mean algorithmic anticipatory regimes that have come to characterize policy and practice in our sector. Regimes that are looked at in a restricted or regimes that are looked at in a restricted way or regimes that plot what the future will look like, um, uh, uh, being futuristic, but focusing in narrow ways on just numbers and just, on, just based on what we have currently. Or regimes that even seek to control or predict the future. Instead, I see some value in, 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 in pursuing an anticipatory consciousness. This is not abandoning the need to lead, not at all. Leaders need to lead and leaders need to forge a prosperous future for our universities. But what an anticipatory stance does, it creates conditions for the possibility of not yet imagined financial future for our sector. And Che, it is with that point then I would like to conclude my input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Osman, for those very insightful remarks. Um, you capture the whole question of sustainability at a broader level. Um, the need for us to make sure that we finance universities properly for them to be able to execute their academic mission. The importance of making sure that we do not compromise the academic mission. I like the last point that you made. We're saying let's move away from just risk management, you know, in terms of being reactive. And we have to develop our capacities to, you know, uh, sense uh, the unknown and, and, and prepare ourselves for these unknowns. Thank you very much for those uh, insightful uh, um, points that you've shared with us, Professor Osman. Let me now invite uh, Professor David Maguire, who is the interim vice chancellor elect, University of Sussex. Prior to this, he was the interim principal and vice chancellor of the University of Dundee in 2020, and vice chancellor of the University of Greenwich from 2011 to 2019. He has also worked in the universities of Birmingham City, Lancaster, Leicester, Plymouth, and Redlands in California. Over to you, Professor Maguire. Thank you very much indeed uh, for that kind introduction and uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I'm speaking to you from just outside London in the UK so I do apologise if the connection all the way to South Africa is not quite as good as it might be. I'm going to talk uh, this afternoon uh, about shared services and to give you some insights into a case study about an organisation called JISC which runs a series of shared services in the IT domain for universities and others around the um, United Kingdom. So I'm gonna tell you about JISC. I'm going to say something about the value that it adds to universities and colleges in the United Kingdom. I'll give you some examples of specific services that JISC operates, and then I'll conclude with a brief discussion and some um, finishing remarks. Well, let me begin with a brief introduction to JISC for those of you that haven't heard of it. Uh, JISC was set up over 25 years ago. It was originally an outgrowth of a government group. It was called the Joint Information Services Committee, although the, the acronym has now been dropped in favor of uh, just the word uh, JISC. And it's essentially a membership-led group, a charity or a social enterprise, if you like, which brings together all of the UK universities and colleges, but also some schools and some research and other organisations to pull their resources to uh, help with dealing with technology matters. So it runs shared technology infrastructure, 
So a big network which connects all universities and colleges together, some data centers, uh, a series of other services, uh, including uh, deals to acquire uh, journal access, uh, e-books, and other important data sets for research purposes. It uh, builds and uh, sells uh, software. Uh, it does deals with third-party software providers to provide that for colleges and universities. And it offers general advice and guidance on a wide range of different topics. It's quite a large organization. Uh, in the last published accounts, it was about 182 million pounds of turnover. It's now above uh, 190 million for the last financial year, last academic year. And it employs in excess of 900 staff all working on these types of activities. So just breaking down the funding uh, a little bit, and I took this graphic from the last published accounts, it's quite a complex picture uh, to recreate how JISC is funded because there's a fairly detailed and complex history, membership structure, and also geography. It turns out that in the United Kingdom, education is one of the matters which is funded in each of the four nations, England, Scotland, uh, Ireland, and Wales. But at the bottom, you can see that 37% of the income comes from government grants. Um, it's a distributed collection of uh, government bodies that fund research and education in the UK and the four nations. About a third of the revenue also comes from what are called digital resources. Essentially, that's JISC purchasing uh, preferential access to journals and doing deals with suppliers like Elsevier, uh, John Wiley Macmillan, uh, Open University Press, and a number of important data suppliers. Income from services, about 15%. So that's consulting, strategic consulting uh, services, uh, a bit of training in there, and a number of other things. And universities and colleges themselves contribute um, actually 10% of the government funding, but it's overall about 7% of the overall JISC income. And then there's a miscellaneous group of about 8%. So 182 million seems a lot of money, and in some respects it really is, but by another method, it's not quite enough to do everything that uh, JISC wants to do and the community uh, wants JISC to do. JISC thinks of the world in terms of four types of activities. Its principal function is to enable world-class education and research in the United Kingdom. And as I've said, it does that by providing excellent e-infrastructure to run it. It provides advice and guidance on a range of different services. And it will build new solutions where there's a market failure or where it can collaborate with uh, proprietary developers and providers to do that in a more efficient or a more effective way. But it's not really a software and services development organization uh, as such. Let me talk about the Janet Network briefly, uh, please. Um, this is what in the jargon is called a National Education Research Network, an NREN. It's not unlike a tenant, the South African uh, network, and you're going to hear about that in, in a while. It is one of the largest and fastest private networks anywhere in the world, period. Um, it's very, very high performance. It has connections up to 600 gigabits per second. And just remember that we normally talk about our home connections as being measured in uh, 20, 30, 40 megabits per second, so a whole uh, thousand times uh, slower. It has direct connections to about 600 organizations to minimize traffic around the network. So this would be the likes of Amazon and Microsoft and Netflix and people like that. And every day, around 5.3 petabytes of data is pushed around uh, the network. But it's not just pipes and routers and devices. It's also a suite of services on top which help to uh, enable productivity amongst uh, users of, in the community. In addition to uh, Janet, here's a list of some other types of key services that JISC operates. Cybersecurity is becoming increasingly important, and every year JISC will spend several million pounds on behalf of the community to try to protect uh, the network, to protect the data and protect the people 
that use it in universities, colleges and schools. I think it's well known that the trend in IT to seek to move things into the cloud, to host services there, to put data in, in large uh, repositories uh, and to access that uh, independent of location anywhere on the network. And JISC is advising universities and colleges about how to do that. And it's also hosting increasingly uh, third party and university data sets in data centers in the cloud and building shared services which are delivered in this way. I'll speak in a minute about learning analytics, so I won't say anything now about that. Ditto, I'll come on to Library Hub in a minute. JISC also delivers lots of solutions for the research community in terms of research infrastructure beyond the network. So some of the biggest worldwide experiments, such as uh, decoding the genome, um, quantum physics, uh, the um, distributed telescope uh, array in astronomy, they're all enabled by uh, the connectivity and services which JISC operates. And then in a moment, I'll speak also about uh, educational technology and facilitating uh, the ecosystem there. Let me just run through a few of the shared services which JISC enables. So on the network, there are things called certificates, which are really just about protecting uh, packets of information data that's transferred around the network and just sells a service to enable people uh, to acquire those in a cost effective basis. It also does a lot of security testing, not just of the Janet network, but individuals network uh, on campus which connect to Janet. So it does what's called penetration testing to look for breaches or holes in the network which may be vulnerable to attract by bad actors. Uh, on the internet. Something which I think uh, the UK community is really proud of is a service called Edgerome, which essentially allows anybody who's registered in any university to use those same credentials to seamlessly connect from any other university or library or research institute um, in the UK or indeed anywhere in the world where there's an Edgerome connection. So it's facilitating uh, people, staff and students moving between locations to make it easy to connect onto a single unified network and share the same credentials and the same uh, services. And as you might imagine, there's some protection for email coming in and going out. I said earlier on that JISC has done a lot of collective deals and saves literally tens of millions of pounds each and every year for universities and, and colleges. And I've just listed a small number of what is over 100 different deals for buying everything from software to telephony to data sets, journal subscriptions, uh, and so on and, and, and so forth. We do uh, provide an awful lot of advice and assistance to uh, staff, not just people in IT centers and IT uh, services, but also staff that want to conduct large experiments or research projects. And especially in the last few years for people who want to teach using technology enhanced learning. We've had a big program I'll talk about in a few minutes uh, about uh, helping the UK deal with the recent pandemic and develop its skills and capabilities in this area. Financial X-Ray is about helping organizations understand how they're spending their money in IT to ensure that they're doing it in the most uh, optimum, uh, different way. There's advice, advice provided on legal and regulatory uh, use of information, general data protection uh, register, uh, safety, and um, the sensible use of, of information as well. So I've talked a lot about technology so far, but I wouldn't like this talk to pass without remarking on how JISC uses and works very, very closely with the library and information community in universities. And they are a big constituent user base. Uh, for many, many years now, JISC has been supporting libraries in their use of information, in uh, providing cost-effective access to journal, e-books, uh, data, and other services has actually built consortia to digitize uh, journal and data archives, um, some historical text, maps, and, and other information. But one interesting project we're really proud of, proud of is a thing called the National 
bibliographic knowledge base. And in essence, what this does is it brings together all of the catalogues for all of the universities in the UK. There are 176 catalogues linked together, uh, some 48.5 million uh, metadata records of uh, library holdings. Uh, these are woven together, integrated, such that any person, any user in any university uh, with an internet connection can search the catalog quickly, uh, find out what's there, find out where it's held, and if necessary, uh, use it online or ask for it to be transferred uh, to their library for, uh, for direct uh, in-person physical uh, use. It also helps librarians um, compare resources with other libraries to ensure there's not too much overlap. And it helps with cataloging the information as well. And there's a little link there if you want to follow. Another service uh, which has been developed in uh, the relatively recent past is called GIST National Learning Analytics System. The idea behind this is that we can help students obtain optimum outcomes and to uh, help with retention if we use uh, data about how they interact with the many services at the university and we build uh, processes and we build uh, reactive uh, and, and proactive plans to help them uh, maximize um, how they work at the university and how they progress. So at the heart of that is a big database with millions and millions of individual records about learners, students' interaction with various university services. There's some tools to integrate data and make sense of it, and also a modeling analytic predictor to help model what will be a likely outcome based on those data. There are a suite of applications, a dash dashboards which essentially provide reports on all of those data by student, by department, by course, indeed by any way you want to cut it. There's a tool for um, querying the database and, and finding, for example, all students who've not met a particular threshold to identify how we can follow up with them. And there's a little uh, telephone uh, mobile app for students where they can set goals and they can um, be encouraged to um, um, use it through gamification to, to work hard essentially and to, to obtain good outcomes. And it plugs in at the bottom there to pretty much every sort of uh, data set you can think. So who's using the library? Who's using the virtual learning environment or the learning management system? Uh, what's in the student records about their assessments and, and so on, uh, whether they've attended classes on campus, and, and lots of other things as well. In some cases, what equipment have they used in, in different labs and other facilities? All that's integrated together in the database. It's mashed up and reports are produced. And then importantly, people can uh, use that to uh, make decisions about uh, how they can encourage the university students to, to uh, progress and, and optimize their outcomes. A little bit about learning and teaching. Um, the pandemic obviously has had a major, major impact on our ability to deliver in-person teaching. And uh, many, many universities around the world uh, have been required to move to virtual teaching on, online. And what we did is we ran a big program integrating uh, multiple universities. Uh, I chaired a body of over 20 vice chancellors and other senior people in universities. We conducted uh, various surveys. We talked to lots of students and we produced a series of reports. These are bookended by a part time report on the left there and a full time report on the right. And then a series of uh, thematic reports in the middle on the digital learning, employability, assessment, and uh, how strategic leaders should react to uh, the digital future. And these are all available online. You can Google them or go to the GIST website to, to download them. And hopefully there's some useful information you can learn about uh, what's the state of art, of the art, uh, what pitfalls uh, you can seek to avoid and uh, recommendations for uh, the government, for university administrators, for staff and also for students, how they can prosper in an increasingly uh, digital learning and teaching environment of the future. 
Well, just a moment about the future uh, for JISC. Um, I think looking forward, it's pretty obvious that there's a huge appetite and a well-developed now uh, return on investment um, uh, series of case studies, which show that these things do work technically, but they also work financially to everyone's uh, benefit. So uh, there are more and more opportunities for these shared services. One of those in particular is this idea about uh, expanding into education technology, essentially enabling a whole series of often new and innovative um, organizations to produce educational technology and to provide a pathway into universities so that they can be technically and commercially successful and hopefully a more and more ingenious and innovative technology can be used uh, for the benefit of staff and, and students. The JISC Education, Education and Research Mission has been grouped around two themes, Education 4.0 and Research 4.0. If you want to find out about those, again, you can Google it. There's quite extensive information on the, on the Google, on the website uh, of JISC. But three things are emerging, uh, probably no surprises here. How can we harness the power of artificial intelligence to help with everything from um, student services to learning and teaching to research? Picking up on the internet of things, everything's going to have an IP address and be accessible uh, on the web, massive amounts of data, but also the ability to connect things together and to do some really sophisticated, integrated, distributed computing for the benefit of research and education. And thirdly, uh, big, big data. We've already got petabytes of data. These are going to, to, uh, to grow and we need tools to organize, manage, synthesize query and, and use that in a more a more efficient way. So in conclusion, Chair, um, I hope I've demonstrated that JISC is a successful higher education and further education and shared service provider today and has been now for over 25 years. It has been able to deliver major return on investment for universities and colleges. And if we had more time, I could go through some of the case studies that we've done to show some of the numbers behind that. Right now, I think the key challenges for JISC are around funding. How can we ensure that the same core funding comes in to provide their basic services in an environment of, of austerity post, uh, post pandemic? How do we possibly keep up with the very, very rapid developments in, in technology? It's a full-time job even for the people at JISC, uh, let alone people in universities and colleges. And ultimately, how do we recruit the world's most excellent people to, uh, to run these systems and to provide universities what they need and deserve to do great work in the future? So thank you very much for, for listening, and uh, I'll pass you back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Maguire, for that very insightful presentation, I should say, you know, very interesting case study. I can assure you we'll have a couple of uh, questions to ask during the discussion period. Let me now move on to our third presenter, uh, Dr. Diane Parker, who is currently an advisor to the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Pretoria. Um, her role is focused mainly on strategy coordination and implementation. She recently retired from the Department of Education and Training where she was Deputy Director General of University Education. Prior to joining the department in 2008, Dr. Parker spent 18 years as a teacher, educator, and academic in the fields of sociology of education, mathematics education, and teacher education. Over to you, Dr. Parker. Uh, thank, thanks a lot, Gerald. Um, I'd just like to maybe just start uh, to say, you know, thank you very much for uh, to the previous presenters because I, th I think the the pre presentations although very different, are actually quite complementary. Um, and uh, somehow, uh, I think that perhaps my presentation will also resonate in some ways with it. Um, as we were, you know, beginning this, um, I, I'd indicated that I was going to be looking at uh, this idea by using uh, some examples from the national perspective in you know, the work of uh, the Department of Higher Education and Training over the last few years. Um, and, you know, when I was thinking about this topic of ser uh, shared services, 
I must say, I, I came to it from a different um, perspective. Um, I wasn't thinking about uh, necessarily sh shared services um, as a, a way of um, uh, creating financial sustainability, although one would hope that they would um, uh, uh, create efficiencies, um, but rather from the perspective of how can we use uh, shared services yeah, we lost you. Sorry, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay, now I don't, I don't know why, but um, my screen seems to be stuck. I'm just going to stop sharing and then um, share again, if that's okay. It's that's, that's just fine. stuck and I can't move it. Um, it's, it's showing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, has it gone on to presentation mode? Mm -mm. Oh, dear. Yeah, but it's fine, that we, okay. we can see the stuff. Hopefully, can, yeah, hopefully you can it will. I've got a, I've got one of these circles going round and round. This is technology for you. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> <But> really, <laughs> um, uh, you know, thinking about it from the from the perspective of how can we use shared services to strengthen cooperation, collaboration, and partnerships across the system. We have a fairly small national system. We only have twenty six universities. And of course, if we include the TVET colleges in, in that, there are 50 public TVET colleges. Um, uh, thinking about this from a public um, institution uh, point of view, although I can't see why in the long run, um, private institutions shouldn't also be um, mm -hmm. included. Um, it really about how do you use shared services to, to leverage information and expertise for the common good, um, develop capacity. And, and, and I think this is one of the risks around uh, shared services is that um, when you look at it from a perspective of um, you know, outsourcing, <laughs> it's, some, it's somewhere outside of the university. Sometimes, um, you know, people within the university could hand over responsibility. So how do you create that, uh, that tension between um, the need for capacity development in the institution uh, uh, linked to the, 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 um, the service? Um, strengthening of systems, improved efficiencies and effectiveness, of course, and improved quality. And then from, from our perspective, it was always about how do we think about access to and success in higher education. Um, and, you know, the critical factors seem to be, uh, you know, obviously institutions need to buy into it. And if one wants to do it at a national level, it needs all institutions to become part of the system. It can't be where some are in and some are out, because that um, also causes difficulties with being able to, um, to deal with the, with the issues. Um, there have to be clear gains for everybody involved. Uh, both um, your, every institution. And I think um, uh, Pro Professor um, uh, Roxana mentioned that in terms of, you know, how do we deal with this in a, such a differentiated system where we have some very, uh, very advanced uh, universities who've got um, great financial uh, um, balance sheets and others that don't necessarily have that. So how do we deal with that? Um, the issue of security and the popular um, compliance is critical um, because often when we're talking about this, we are talking about information that is sensitive. And then the whole issue of cybersecurity, because many of the sh shared services, it does appear would be IT based. Um, so the kind of examples that I could think of that are currently underdeveloped or, or in development or about to be developed, um, and there are others as well, but um, th these are the ones that, that came to mind. And, and listening to uh, Prof. McGuire's um, uh, presentation, I, I was just wondering if maybe we should be thinking bigger. And rather than um, setting up all these separate things, set up one thing to do all of the things that we need um, to create this kind of cooperation, collaboration, and, and, and data-driven um, um, uh, processes, but but anyhow, the the things that we have um, on the on the table at the moment, which are funded through the department, are the National Student Data Warehouse, 
um, which is really about uh, seeing how we can leverage data analytics for student success. Uh, the macro infrastructure framework and the infrastructure support program, which is looking at across the system how you can uh, create uh, uh, services to support um, uh, infrastructural development, which takes place at the institutional level. Um, the central application service, which is something that's been long in, in the making and, and still isn't um, uh, in place, but the project is on its way. It was supposed to be piloted this year, but um, I think project management issues and a few other issues um, have gotten in the way. And, and one uh, does really hope that this can, can come across because it, it seems that we've got buy-in from all the institutions. Um, so, so really, uh, it is a critical uh, area for, for the country. Currently, we have applications, um, you know, individuals having to apply to different institutions across the system. And every year we hear about the, you know, 80,000 applications at the one institution and 120,000 at another and so on. And we know that many of those are, are um, the same people applying. So that central application service is supposed to be a one-stop shop for um, applications to institutions. 10 institutions, up to 10 institutions or 10 programs, um, and uh, also to um, student funding, as well as uh, accommodation. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, if that can be made successful, it would really um, create a much greater um, possibilities within the system in terms of access, but also, um, uh, sensible processes for, for um, applications into universities. Um, then there's the National Learning uh, Open Learning System NOLS, which has been developed by the department um, in partnership with the European Union. And uh, that's a, a, a national open learning uh, platform. And part of what they've done is developed a whole lot of open learning materials, open educational resources, um, uh, specific ones for TVETs, really, for engineering, and there are a whole number of um, specific um, trades that they're busy developing them for, national occupational certificates, um, but also for the um, advanced diploma for uh, TVET um, lecturers, which has been developed across the university system. Um, 13 institutions have been involved in that. And a number of the institutions, including the CPUT and UP are currently using the, um, the advanced diploma materials that are on the platform. Um, and you know they're looking at developing this as a platform that all our institutions can utilize to, to, um, uh, to share open learning uh, resources. Um, and, and we do think that that's an important area um, for, for, the, for the system. Um, and then the last one is the HELM program, which is run by Yousaf. It's a, also a collaborative pro, pro, pro project. Um, and then <laughs> there, there's also been talk about a, a possibility of a national digital library, sort of linking the library, uh, getting the resources into a national data um, a, a data platform so that um, all our institutions can have more equitable access to knowledge resources. Um, I think I think the um, uh, you know I, I wanted to just use two examples the one the National Student Data Warehouse and I'll go through this fairly quickly but just um, a little bit of information ar around it um, that it's a national platform to integrate and leverage large data sets. And specifically, the data on um, from HEMIS, the HEMIS data, um, DBE data from um, uh, the, the National Senior Certificate and other senior certificate results, um, and then um, other kinds of data on individual students, et cetera, to enable tracking across the system. Um, it is also a national collaborative project. It was... Um, it's come about through the Sia Pomalela uh, uh, project, which is funded by, by Kresge, and their data um, um, uh, advisory body uh, suggested that we needed something like this. Because while individual institutions have been, um, uh, you know, developing their own data analytics processes, 
access to these national databases is actually really important as well, particularly the longitudinal data. Um, and, you know, we're busy working at the moment around the popular challenges for compliance. Um, it's been developed in three phases. The, the design phase has already been done. Um, and the building phase is supposed to be happening now, but it can't happen before the Papia issues are dealt with. Um, but the platform would become a, a departmental platform. Um, it, it's not yet clear about the governance. We've got to sort that out. Uh, but there'll be uh, strong security measures in place and access rights um, to institutions at, at various levels. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, th this diagram just gives a kind of potted overview of um, what the platform would look like. There are various data, data sources. Um, there'll be the, the, the sort of um, uh, student... Um, the, the, the uh, sorry, the database, the data warehouse, various data marks, um, and starting with the HEMIS qualification enrollment data, the course enrollment data, the undergraduate cohort data, the postgraduate cohort data, student uh, tracking facilities, um, and then uh, from the DBE, the school leaving outcomes, um, and the school leaving subjects, and then those will build, be built up over time to include other information that is collected once we've sorted out the, um, the issues around the personal information. But it is important to be able to carry the personal information uh, to be able to allow for the kind of data analytics. And I think it's similar to the kind of stuff that, that David was talking about, but that's far more advanced than we are. Um, and then there'll be different uh, levels of access, obviously. Um, any institution can get full access to its own information, but when it comes to information from other institutions, it would be anonymi anonymized and um, th there'll be security levels involved, uh, but it will enable uh, comparative um, uh, data um, analytics as well. Um, but, but looking through the, the various levels. Um, the next uh, one is really the macro infrastructure um, uh, framework and the infrastructure development support. And, and th this came about um, because of the infrastructure and efficiency grant that the department provides to, to um, universities. Since 2007, there's been about 30 billion Rand that's been dispersed across our universities. Um, and, and we recognized there were many challenges uh, at the institutional level and at the national level um, that required a, a system that uh, would enable um, uh, development, capacity development at institutional level, um, but also um, monitoring and evaluation, uh, tracking and accountability at the national level. Um, it's a cloud-based uh, platform that includes a sort of infrastructure management guides, there are all kinds of different um, parts of that that include principles, norms, standards, etc. cetera, um, and they're detailed annexures. Uh, it's a 30 page guide and it has about 17 different annexures, including examples of policies, etc. cetera. Um, and there's um, a link to, to that, our 17 um, infrastructure management milestones. Um, and a maturity model, which enables M&E at the national level, but also self-assessment at the, at the institutional level. Um, the infrastructure development uh, is really provided by a team of subject matter experts in the built environment um, that uh, provide support at different levels. And I'll, I'll just come to that quickly. Um, but I think, uh, you know, really important that, uh, that we did this because prior to 2017, when this was, um, uh, you know, put in place, we were not able to draw an easy report for National Treasury or for the Presidential Infrastructure Council. And what would happen there is that um, each institution would be running around with Excel sheets trying to fill out information when it was requested. And they started becoming quite demanding, wanting information on a monthly basis. So now this can all be drawn from the, from the platform. It also includes baseline information on all universities. 
um, their spatial development plans, their maps, et cetera, on each university. And these will be updated as, as developments happen um, uh, along the way. Um, and then the infrastructure support is, is at different levels because our system is at different levels. So everybody gets advice and information. The platform has these PowerPoints, um, um, information things, there are various workshops that are run on an ongoing basis. Um, and then there's proactive support where institutions come to the department and request report support, for example, on procurement matters. There's a huge issue around procurement. It's very difficult. And, um, you know, we've developed now a, a very strong framework for framework procurements uh, for infrastructure that are used. And there's, then there's intensive support where institutions are really struggling. <coughs> and they provided um, with intensive support by a development team that uh, work side by side with them um, on, on the ground. So, so this is uh, intended to be developed further. It's moved from um, the university ed education section into the planning section in the department, and it will be include, uh, extended to include TVET colleges and community education and, and training colleges. Um, and the idea is to create uh, SME teams to support infrastructure development in the provinces. So, so that would help with bottlenecks, et cetera. Um, and, you know, to, to uh, get this platform um, into that space. So that's where that is at the moment, which is a, a developing, evolving process. And then just in conclusion, um, I think we do have to think about the tension between uh, a competition and collaboration. We have to understand what lends itself to shared services and what doesn't, and then focus on those things where we will be able to get the efficiencies and the cooperation and the partnerships in place, and that will lead to the capacity development that we're looking at. Um, we also have to think about um, the balance between shared services and internal capability at the institution, because the last thing you want is for the say, for for the institution, members in the institution to be thinking the service provider will, will do it. Um, institutions do have to take responsibility for themselves. <coughs> and then there are a couple of questions I've just put, um, put there, uh, you know, can we also improve quality of services for the whole system um, uh, through the capacity development? Uh, can, can we have shared learning plat teaching platforms? Can we have um, shared research collaboration platforms? Um, is there space for consortium type arrangements between institutions, um, particularly at the um, uh, provincial level? We've got a number of institutions in Gauteng, for example, in the Western Cape um, and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Di. As, as, as you mentioned, quite uh, not, not entirely dissimilar from you know, what um, David presented. Um, very interesting ideas. Of course, the scale, as you mentioned, um, you know, in David's presentation is a bit, uh, it's quite big, entire uh, UK system. Thank you so much, Di, for that presentation. Let me now move on to Duncan Greaves, who is a trained political scientist. He was trained at the then University of Natal, now University of Brazil in Natal, an institution that he later served variously as a lecturer in political studies, as academic computing manager, as IT director. He has worked for Tenet since 2003 and has been its CEO since 2013. He has published on problems in Marxism and theory of justice and on policy and conceptual aspects of the interface between information technology and the idea of a university. Over to you, Duncan. Duncan, are you muted? Duncan? Can you hear me? Ah, we can hear you now. I'm terribly sorry about that. The screen sharing obstructed my access to the, the mute control and I didn't have my hardware Sorry button. about that. Technology, as Douglas Adams once said, is stuff that doesn't work yet. Um, Gerald, thank you for that introduction and my appreciation to, uh, to you, sir, for this invitation to speak. I'm going to share with you some observations about the, 
challenges of shared digital services. Digital services are all that I really know about. It's a space that I've worked in for, um, for many years. Um, I'm sorry, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I was involved in the creation of Tenet starting in the last century, and I've worked for it for the last 18 years. So that's the, the primary basis from my perspective. But I was also part of the, the team that worked on the um, Central Applications Office in KwaZulu-Natal. So it's a perspective based upon uh, work in this field, but it's also informed by some um, considerations from the perspective of, of uh, public choice theory. So I make two assumptions. Um, the topic is a very large one and it's got to be trimmed down to size in order to say something useful about it in 15 minutes. So two assumptions here. The first is that the, um, a shared service collaboration, and, that, and that's really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about collaborations to deliver shared services. A shared service collaboration is driven either by functional need or by economic benefit, sometimes by both, if it can deliver both of these things, then that's a, that's a happy outcome. But very often the, the need in, that is being pursued is um, economic efficiency. Um, and sometimes the need that is being pursued is a functional benefit. Um, and we've heard perspectives on both of those in, from the three previous speakers. Um, a second assumption that I make is that uh, collaborators are rational self-interested utility maximizes. That, of course, is one of the central postulates of classical economic theory. It's often wrong, um, and motivations are often not based upon self-interest and utility maximization, or even upon rationality. They can be based upon many other considerations, but let's assume that this is the case because it, it affects the nature of the, the public choice outcomes um, that, that appear in many um, in many collaboration exercise, uh, problems in many collaboration exercises. So I want to talk mostly about solutions which are aimed at um, meeting complex or specialized functional needs. And if you are going to establish a, a service that aims to deliver functional requirements that is at the periphery of an organization, then your problem um, in developing such a solution is generally a problem in aggregating buying power through joint negotiation. Um, and that is, that is really a, um, a negotiation problem. It can be tedious and complex and difficult, um, but it is, it is not necessarily um, terribly demanding. If on the other hand, the shared service that you're trying to develop is to deliver functional or to meet functional needs which lie at the very core of an institution, then you have some major challenges. The closer you get in a, in a university to, to the heart of the institution, research, teaching and learning um, aspects of student administration and the like, the greater the likelihood that, that local needs, um, which are very often associated with um, identifying institutional advantage, are going to be paramount in the, in the minds of that institution. And that raises difficulties in entering into a collaboration because in most collaborations, you're going to have to give up some autonomy and you're often going to have to make some compromises as well. But in spite of that, collaborations are possible. They're often highly successful. Collaborations that deliver rich functional needs are possible and often highly successful. Um, one of the often seen uh, factors sustaining them is when they are um, supported or driven by coherent professional communities in the higher education sector. Um, the Paramount case really there is the community of library professionals, which have been doing these kind of things for a very long time, but it's not the only such community and it, nor is it the only success factor. And it's worth saying that some solutions are possible only through collaboration. And this is especially true when the, when the sharing is not only a means to an end, such as um, economic efficiency, but is an end in itself. 
um, and this is especially true of things like um, like EduRoam and shared identity services, when the benefit can only be got through through sharing. A collaboration that is often pointed to here is what's called a National Research and Education Network. You heard Professor Maguire talk about uh, Janet, um, which falls under JISC's auspices in, in the UK. There's about 100 of these um, NRENs, as they're called worldwide. They're typically unique, one per country. Um, the South African NREN is a, is a complex beast, which I'll say something about in a moment. It's not just tenant. And the um, people, when they think about an NREN, so often say, oh, that's an ISP. You're the ISP that serves uh, universities. Well, that's true in one sense. It's true in the trivial sense that, um, that NRENs provide connectivity to the internet. But in fact, they're generally very different from ISPs in the, in the orthodox commercial sense, because NRENs are optimized for service delivery to higher education and research. The kind of circuits they operate are large and have lots of breathing space in them. You heard Professor Maguire talking about 600 gigabit per second connections to, um, to the network. Um, and they're designed that way. So there's lots and lots of spare capacity for large data transfers, which is increasingly at the heart of um, successful research collaboration. The circuits themselves are optimized for, for short paths to other national research and education networks. Um, so all of these NRENs interconnect with one another. Um, and you can only get those fast interconnections if you, if you are on that NREN itself. You can't get it, generally speaking, through commercial bearing interfaces, not to the same extent at any rate. And the, uh, these are nonprofit communities typically accountable to the communities that they serve. Um, again, you, Professor Maguire spoke about um, just as a, as a membership-led um, charity. Um, a non-profit company in South Africa or non-profit organization it would be. And this is typical of these entities. They're organically bonded to the communities that they serve and generally speaking, highly accountable to them. And I'll say something more about that in a moment. I should probably say a little bit about Tenet at this point because its history is not always that well known. Um, Tenet is a non-profit company. Um, under South African company law, uh, nonprofit companies come in two flavors. There's a flavor with members and there's a flavor without members. We're a nonprofit company with members. Uh, the eligibility for membership is limited to uh, public universities and statutory science and research entities. Uh, but we um, serve a, a community that is much wider than just the membership. Um, so you can be uh, a beneficiary of tenant services without being a member of it. The members are the people who ultimately control the company. They're the people who, who go to the, the, the institutions that are represented at the AGM, who appoint the board of directors, who approve the um, annual financial statements, and who exercise the highest level of control of the company. Currently, Tenet has 32 members, 26 public universities, and six of the statutory science and research councils. And the, that provides a, a, an axis of accountability, critical axis of accountability by means of which Tenet is accountable to its community. Uh, and that is achieved through this governance model in which the members control the appointment of the board of directors and the board of directors controls the company. Now, I do want to say something a little more about this because it, it becomes important in, in a later context. Accountability is absolutely critical because without accountability, you do not have a mechanism to ensure alignment between the activities of the, the service provider and the community that it serves. You would, have to, you would have to emulate it in some kind of way if it didn't exist through some sort of an advisory structure. Um, and those things never work as well as, as, as actual direct accountability. So that's, you must have accountability, but the thing that you don't want in, in a shared collaboration is a set of circumstances in which the beneficiaries are in direct control of the service delivery, because that puts them in the position of being both the customers and the managers. And those roles are, are sometimes in tension with one another. So the, the way 
the tenant governance model works is a, it's an arm's length relationship between the, um, the community, which is ultimately in control of the entity um, and the actual functioning of the, of the company. That arm's length relationship is reinforced by company law um, in terms of which the directors of a company, even though they might be uh, drawn from um, the customer institutions, are nevertheless uh, under legal duty to um, protect the interests of the company in the first interests and to ensure that their actions are taken on its behalf and not on the behalf of, of some other institution that they might be an employee or a member of. In other words, the company under the control of, a, of an expert board of directors, ultimately accountable to the beneficiaries, is a highly successful model. And we believe it's been a major part of the success of Tenet over 20 years. I'll come back to this point a little bit later because it is important. So two other things that are noteworthy about Tenet's success. The, the one is that it delivers a service that is not attainable in any other way, or was not offered by the market in any other way. The, the main service, the, the high capacity um, research and education network with fast connectivity to uh, the, the global research um, network is not something you could get from a commercial ISP. They don't offer those kind of services, certainly not at affordable cost. And the, the suite of services the tenant operates in addition to that that core network functionality is also something that is not typically offered by an ISP. Uh, we do some of what uh, JISC does. I was looking at Professor McGuire's list and, and we can put some ticks against some of those things. Um, we, do, we do cloud brokerage services. We do uh, research data repository support. Um, we have a suite of identity and trust services um, certification. We operate an ORCID consortium. We operate an identity federation, and most importantly, we operate the EduRome service in South Africa. Um, and we have a suite of collaboration services as well, um, of which the most important is our video conferencing service. So we do some of what just does, but we, do, we don't do a whole lot of what it does as well. Um, missing from our uh, portfolio is, is any real support for teaching and learning. Um, um, any real support for analytic services and um, and no systematic or structured consultancy. The third point I want to make here is that the uh, this solution would not have been achievable without collaboration with the state. When Tenet was formed in 2000, the, it was a civil society endeavor. It was, it was set up by the universities acting on their own initiative. They had no support from the state and the state wasn't interested at that time in national research and education networking. It was only in around about 2003 that interest from the, the what was then, the, in fact, I think it was the Department of Arts, Culture, Science and Technology uh, began to emerge. It was only in 2007 that uh, um, funding started to come through for um, uh, for the funding of a, of a significantly sized uh, network. And once that funding started, it has been sustained consistently for um, over, over 13 years, 14 years, um, and a lot of money has been put by the, the state into what is called the SANRE network, the South African National Research Network. That is the network that we operate. We've built large parts of it ourselves, um, a lot of it with the support of the DHET, which um, helped us to connect a lot of rural campuses um, to the network. And more recently, through the National Skills Fund, we're connecting TVET colleges. We will uh, connect 285 of them, 285 campuses of TVET colleges by March of next year. So a, a lot of state support has gone into, into this network and it would not have been possible um, without that state support. So without the, without the wise and foresighted support, which has been consistently sustained over many years of both the DST and, and the DHET, we would not have had the network that we have today. There are, however, inherent challenges in uh, collaborating with the state. And the, the major challenge is 
it goes back to that very problem of accountability. If you have a, an organization, if you have an organization that is accountable to its membership, a, a bottom-up organization like Tenet that is collaborating with an organization that is accountable to its parent entity, like a project of the DST, um, then you, you have diametrically opposed lines of accountability, and that can make um, structuring long-term plans extremely difficult. We've never found a solution to this problem. Um, we're, we're in ongoing pursuit of it, but it's been a major agenda item for, um, for over 10 years in, in our lives. And the other challenge for the future that I want to raise here is um, the possibility of, of something larger and more complex than Tenet. Enrins often evolve into becoming um, parts of um, larger and wider digital services and solutions uh, providers. It's not universally true, but it's very often the case. And the, the exemplar case here is, is JISC. It's the entity to which uh, we look for a, um, a model for the future. We, we will never get to their level of sophistication or size, but the, the, the suite of services that they offer, we think is something that we should be pursuing in South Africa. Could be done as a virtual organization, or it could be done as a as a structured single organization with support from both the state and the um, and the public higher education sector. It is the one agency that Dr. Parker spoke of um, in at some point in her presentation, and we think that it's time that this becomes a major item on the on the agenda of higher education in South Africa. Uh, Gerald, thank you very much. Uh, back to you. Thank you, thank you, Duncan. Very, very interesting success, success factors. I think you captured everything um, that we need to know about uh, success, success factors for a shared services entity. Well, first off is Gerald. We still do not have any questions. No problem, I have a few. So let's start with Professor Osman. And I'm going to ask you a question that Dr. Dye Parker had on her last slide which is, is there a space for consortium between, for consortium type arrangements rather, between institutions sharing mixed services, and in this case, uh, uh, research and teaching arrangements, especially in this context of um, uh, online education and, and we're talking about digital teaching and learning and those kinds of things. Is there room for that in the South African context, even if it's within a few universities, or rather between, between a few universities rather? Mm. So that's an interesting question. And as you can see from the three presenters, there's lots of examples around um, shared services, particularly in the domain of analytics, whether it applies to teaching and learning, whether it applies to um, 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 access to books or access library acquisitions, etc. I definitely think there's a room for consortiums, absolutely. But I indicated early on in my presentation that we operate in quite an unequal environment. So one would need to take that fact into account. And the unequal environment is not just a South African environment. I'm talking about a global environment. So one would need to take that fact into account. And I do think like with all partnerships, um, you choose your partners well, who goes into the consortium, you choose them well. And I, in my case, I would want to be in a consortium that's committed to our aspirations for global solidarity and African solidarity. So absolutely, a direct answer to that is yes, there's room for that. Uh, we'd have to think carefully about which areas this would be and um, that it should be underpinned by shared values and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Osman. Professor Maguire, very interesting model of shared services. Certainly, you do not have the kinds of inequalities that we have here in South Africa, you know, between institutions. But I'm just curious about the funding model for, for JISC. Is this entirely state-funded? Are universities having to chip in? And how is that working? 
Yes, as I said in my presentation, funding is a major issue. It has been the whole time I've been part of the JISC organisation, and I'm sure it will be for many years to come. I think JISC is, is fortunate that uh, its core funding does come in the form of block grant from the government, both for capital and uh, revenue uh, activities. Um, but that's changing, and uh, as the years go by, the proportion that comes directly by way of grant is decreasing. Um, it's partly a consequence, I think, of the success of JISC and the demonstration of the services that it offers, but it's also a recognition that, um, at best, government funding is uh, fixed at flat cash and therefore decreasing on an annual basis by the level of inflation. Uh, I think um, it is a tough it is a tough decision, and uh, every year I think the the executive and the board do 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 look uh, and do work hard to con to stimulate the government to continue to fund it. Um, I, I I think that certainly the 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 civil servants, uh, the people controlling the budgets, are big fans of of this and understand the case. It's the the, uh, the, the uh, members of parliament and, uh, and the members of the, the core government treasury who uh, are, it's more difficult to convince because they are partly a little bit more remote uh, remote from it. Thank you. And, and institutions usually, you know, get concerned about their data, you know, uh, from your presentation, you'll be able to know how the various institutions are performing in terms of their students and in terms of um, other elements of what universities do. Are, are there some confidentiality issues, some concerns from institutions around their data, how it can be used? Do you always need to um, get permission from the, the, the institutions for you to use this, this data, be it for research or reporting to government departments? Absolutely, data confidentiality is absolutely critical and paramount to the success of shared services. Uh, when the UK was in the European Union, uh, we operated under extremely strict uh, laws about uh, how personal information could be used and, and shared. And, and GISC actually has contributed both to the development of policy uh, on that and, and also um, an explanation of how the rules operate and how they apply in the university and college uh, domains. Um, in terms of the learning analytics system you may be referring to, actually the data is, is uh, managed by GIS, but it's, in, it's opaque as far as the service is concerned. It's only the individual universities um, that have access to their own information and can see and interpret it, what, that, what that actually means. So to answer your question, yeah, data confidentiality is absolutely critical and central to success in this area. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that. Let me let me move. We'll come back to you, Prof. Maguire. Let me now move to Dr. Dai Parker. Dai, what would you tell universities that are skeptical about the central application service? Those who think it's a risk, those who think it's going to affect their competitiveness, their autonomy, those who think it's going to cost them money. They're going to lose money when this thing is uh, the system is running. What would you tell them to reassure them? Thanks, uh, uh, Gerald. I mean, I think we, we, you know, over the last 10 years, there have been so many conversations about exactly this, to get buy-in from, from all the universities. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, uh, particularly since 2015, with the fees must fall. Um, I see I must start my video, sorry, mm. apologies. Um, there, <laughs> I've done it. Um, <laughs> particularly, uh, you know, over the last couple of years since fees must fall, um, most institutions have recognized uh, that um, having a central service that actually works would be to their advantage rather than disadvantage. It, it wouldn't, it, for, for the, you know, because individual students would still select who they want to apply for and what they want to apply for. Um, institutions themselves, it's, it's an application service, not an admission service. So institutions themselves would then select 
um, from the applicants. But it will create a much better efficiency in terms of acceptance and students knowing when they've got a space, they have to um, you know, uh, take up that space quickly, not wait around for another space to arrive in the system, which is what currently happens, and creates great um, inefficiencies over registration time um, at universities and, and difficulties, you know, the, the complaints about students who thought they had a space, but then when they go back to that university, they no longer have the space because they were waiting, playing a wait and see game uh, mm -hmm. for, a, for a different university. Um, and then from a, so, so it has um, uh, advantages for, for institutions, but it also has advantages for students themselves, you know, um, they don't have to go and, and, and put in 10 different application forms. I mean, mm -hmm. we know in medical, in the, in the medical sciences, for example, we have um, huge numbers of applicants at every university. You know, there are only like 180 or 200 spaces and you'll have 10,000 applications because, <laughs> and every university gets all 10,000 of those, the nine, 10 universities that offer um, um, uh, medicine. And then students are running around all over the place trying to find um, spaces. And we've seen actually that it's very effective. It happens in the UK in the in Canada, in parts of Africa, in, in a lot of other countries, um, uh, and it is a, a very effective system. I think the initial concerns that were expressed in the early 2000s, we, we, we've, we've moved past that. Everybody's just frustrated because we need to get the system up and running, and um, it needs to be an effective system before, before we, we transfer across to, 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 to the national. Thank you, thank you, Dan. We finally have a question. Um, um, I'll direct this question to you, Duncan. Um, could the notion of a social compact open the doors for engaging with philanthropy and corporates, but also the rest of civil society? A complex question. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so, so uh, speaking now, not as, a, as someone who works for Tenet or mm -hmm. um, as a, as a person who works in digital services, but speaking as a, as a, as a political scientist, the, the levels of social cohesion in South Africa are, are low and seem to have been, and yes, thank you, start my video. Um, levels of social cohesion are low and have, have been falling under, under pressure from a, an enormous variety of stresses. And the, in many ways, our, our society is, is at risk of, of, of breaking entirely at those levels. A regeneration at that kind of a level would would uplift the entire country, um, and it may well unleash all sorts of, of energies of exactly that kind. In addition, it's also worth remarking that the um, there's there's large cash reserves, in my understanding. Um, I'm not an economist or a business person, but um, as far as I know which uh, is being um, held onto by uh, capital, by business people. Um, I'm choosing my words carefully because the word capital has been used quite often in this, in this conference so far, um, which, which is simply not being invested. And if, if there were more investment in our own country by our own people, then that would unlock, unlock all kinds of wellsprings which are currently not flowing. And, and perhaps that would un, un, unleash some of those forces that the, the question goes to. So that's an answer off the top of my head. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably not a very helpful answer. It's probably quite, um, um, quite abstract in the face of the question. It's a real pity that one can't take a question like this from the audience because then <laughs> one can directly, then one can calibrate one's answer in a much more mm -hmm. careful way. But that would be my immediate response. But, but Duncan, what would Tenet need to do for it to become a JISC? One minute. <laughs> so just because 30 times the staff the tenant does and about 30 times the revenue, it's an enormous thing. That's not within our reach in, in the next 10 years. We have to pick and choose what, what is strategically important now. It seems to me that what is strategically important now to our community, um, and it's something that the tenant has not been engaged in at all, and if I had more than a minute, minute I'd say more about it, is support in the teaching and learning spaces. 
for things like shared teaching and learning systems. They can be multi-tenanted um, so that it's, it's a platform or it's a it's a um, it's infrastructure or a platform in which on which institutions can construct their own systems, coupled coupled with a layer of quite serious capacity development to, to bring along the institutions which probably can't work in those spaces easily right now by themselves. That would be my immediate answer. Colleagues, uh, Professor Osman, Professor Maguire, uh, Duncan Greaves, Dr. Di Parker, uh, Professor Fitzgerald, thank you, thank you very much for your contributions to this session. We've come to the end of our discussion. I wish we had more time. There are quite a number of interesting questions that I wanted to ask, but sadly we have to stop here. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Enjoy the rest of the day.